you if you submitted. Okay, so let's go ahead and cut this for YouTube. I'm going to start it off by saying, hi everyone, welcome to this weekly Wednesday live stream. I'm Von Art, and today I'm going to be going through drawing some crabs, lobsters, maybe talk about some movies, and answer some questions along the way. So thank you guys for joining, and for the next two hours, I'm going to go ahead and kind of free draw here. So I'm going to be working on, let me make sure you guys can see this, this upper left corner, I'm going to be hopefully doing a lobster and two crabs. We'll see if I'm good at talking while drawing. Sometimes I get in a habit of ranting, or I just have like, I word vomit and I get distracted on actually drawing. So I'm trying to stay focused today. And for those of you who don't know what this drawing is, this is my latest kind of giant piece that I'm working on right now. It is, oh, that is so loud. Hold on. <laughs> Let me turn that down a little bit. Jeez. Um, well, thank you, Jelly, for subscribing. I'm going to turn the volume down just a bit. Because I don't know how loud it is for you guys, but for me, it's like, it's pretty alarming. Oh, God, and it just looks like I'm sweating. I swear I'm not, I haven't been kidnapped. I'm just in the basement. <laughs> okay, so here you can see uh, the whole composition kind of. But essentially, it's to represent being vegan for a whole year. And every year, I redraw this character. And the first year, it was just him with a little piglet. And then last year, it was him with the pig being a little older. I don't know if I have it down here. I don't think I do. Um, you know what? I do have last year. So hold on. Let me go grab that really quick. Okay, it's just a print of what I did last year, but it still captures essentially what I drew. So you can see how this was him last year. The pig's a little older. I threw in my unofficial mascots, the black and white buns. And then this kind of giant... <laughs> it was supposed to be a lion with leaves as the hair, but it kind of just turned out into be like trippy spinach. So it's my trippy spinach lion. And this was... A challenge for me in having a drawing go edge to edge, which is something I still struggle with. Oh boy, we're getting, we're getting, uh, what's that called? Rated. Well, thank you, everyone. But essentially, this was a tough one for me because I, I like to play with contrast, but you can see how it gets lost with so much noise. I have a lot of contrast going on, and it can be hard for someone to focus on this piece. That's why with this new one... Well, thank you for Rosario Sato for subscribing. But with this one, I'm trying to make it very simple. It's He's in the center, all these animals are around him, and it's more of a graphic piece. I've been very influenced by Muka recently. So what this piece represents is all the animals that are, on average, eaten by an American per year. And I found the statistics, which basically is one cow, well, thank you everyone for subscribing. <laughs> this was unexpected. Uh, the animals were one cow, one pig, one turkey, and then 27 chickens, 40 fish, and then 130 shellfish. And that is why I probably saved this shellfish for last because I knew it would be the longest. But this was a really fun piece to do. I don't know if it's because I've never drawn fish before, but if you guys have never drawn fish in profile, I would give it a try. This is so much fun. <laughs> the turkey has been the most frustrating, if I was honest with you. I'll give you guys a close-up of that. And you can tell that a lot of this looks very light. That's because I've only been working in a 2H pencil so far. So I'm going to be working with a 2B to darken and punch up a lot of the values, similar to the way that the boy's hand and this side of the hair has been. Why, thank you for all the new followers. I Man, I haven't been rated like this in a couple months, so this is great. So today I'm going to be working on that lobster and the crabs because that is included in the shellfish. So I'm going to have one giant lobster, two crabs, have the same on this corner. And then literally I'm just going to draw a bunch of mussels, oysters, clams, and have that kind of scatter around to, to get that final number of 140 shellfish. Because that is a lot to deal with. 
Okay, or 130, I think it is. So why don't we go ahead and get started. I'm gonna, I don't want this to like poke into my stomach, so I'm gonna move this forward. We're gonna refocus here. And like I said, next week, I'm hoping the quality of the camera and the light will be better in here because I ordered a new camera and all four of those lights. So I'm hoping that I can get it all together with my PA next Tuesday. So for next Wednesday, we'll have a nice light or nice lit stream because I feel like upstairs, it's been really rough the past like month. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start off with the 2H. That's kind of what I start all my drawings with now. And... Well, thank you for following. And the reason for that is it's really easy to erase. I don't have to worry about making dark marks that can't be lifted with a kneaded eraser. Well, thank you guys, man. I'm, I think I'm just gonna hear that noise for a little bit, so I might talk over it a little bit, so bear with me here. And I'm just using uh, Google image searches on crabs and lobsters, but here's a little insider tip. If you're an artist, just Google whatever subject matter you're looking for, and then isolate it. Because usually that will have your subject matter on a completely white background with no other elements included. So that's how it's really easy for me to find, especially for animals, quick reference that I can draw a reference in terms of proportion and for uh, the value that I want to capture. Thank you. <laughs> I know that I'm probably like awkwardly close to the camera, so just ignore me because I'm like leaning down. So every now and then I might even go out of frame. That is something, just expect it. And like I said, I want to answer your questions here today, so let me go ahead. I'm going to make sure I can see this. It was a dragon raid. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You guys are great. Blink twice when we have to come and rescue you. <laughs> uh, it is a sturgeon. Yeah, Sean, you got that. It is a sturgeon fish. Oh, and please be sure you put add von art before your comment or question just so it's easy for me to see. Oh, you didn't start the stream for YouTube. Uh, so I don't stream live on YouTube. I put the video on YouTube after the stream's over. All right, now the thing with these animals that I've been trying to capture is they all have this fun texture. Or at least the, the fish definitely did. But the lobster definitely has some of the spotty texture that I want to recreate. And I always tell people that I render in small circles, but they never believe me. But you can see here, I'm just building up the value by doing a continuous spiral of small circles. And the other reason I like doing it with this kind of texture is because any over circle that kind of overlaps itself, but maybe it's spaced a little off, it creates this off circle and it almost adds to the texture that I'm trying to create anyways. So cross hatching obviously would still create a cool look, but I think in terms of creating this texture that I'm really seeking to recreate here, I think having the small circle technique works. And the beauty about traditional art is you can get the results, very similar results, with many different techniques. So even though I don't really use cross hatching that much, a lot of the look that I'm going to be getting in the end can be achieved with pretty much any uh, style of rendering. Like I could cross hatch this all, I'd probably have to do very small cross hatching, but it would still get me the same result. You know what, I'm gonna take my glasses off for this. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Sean says, I'm definitely a water creature nerd and I love seeing all my favorite creatures in this. I love drawing aquatic anything. I'm probably similar to you in that way because you can add so much texture and it doesn't matter if it, it's off. You know when you draw people and if you draw like the eye slightly off, like it's instantly recognizable that something's wrong if someone's looking at it. But with the fish, 
I mean, if I was honest with you guys, I started making them up. Like, <laughs> a lot of them are based on real fish. But near the end of it, I was kind of having fun making my own breeds of fish. And I, it will be interesting, you know, someone looking at this that really understands or, like, has a knowledge of fish, which ones are real and which ones are fake. I mean, some of them are definitely a little more fantastical. Like, you can kind of call out which ones might not be real fish, but I had so much fun with it. And I think a lot of it is because I'm a texture artist. I love adding texture to anything. I can render for hours. It's like my, my pastime. And texture is one of those things where if you really spend the time on it, you can create really cool, realistic textures that hopefully can evoke the feeling in the viewer that they can feel it. Like if they see it, they can almost imagine rubbing their fingertips on the surface of whatever texture it is. Like if I'm doing scales or if I'm doing something slimy or if I'm doing something rough or I'm doing something prickly, I want the viewer to feel that just by looking at it. And I think that is something that is fun to try to kind of challenge yourself as an artist to do. Why, well, thank you, Chili Kitty. And... Oh, the second one got covered by my face. I'm sorry for whoever that second one was. Oh, why is he nice? Why, thank you guys. Now, the other thing you may have noticed with the way that I'm rendering a lot of this is I'm very much relying on contrast to create the separation of forms. Because when you have so many, and to be honest, it's something that I'm going to have to focus on when I go back through uh, my final pass is making sure that everything reads right while still giving and directing the attention to the boy in the center. And it's something that I will most likely do during this weekend. So you know what? I might actually stream maybe on Friday. I don't know. I think I will do one more live stream that isn't the typical Wednesday one just for you guys to see how I finish this piece off. Because not only am I finishing this one, but then there's... Let me show you the other piece that I currently have to have finished soon. So this is what I'm also working on right now. It's a boy sitting on a moon. But I'm, I'm honestly just having so much fun drawing these stars and having a contrast gradient from dark to light and having the stars like fade in or fade out. So this is a birthday present that I need to be finishing very soon. So it's like a battle between that and this. And... I guess I have some news that I can share with you guys. I have two announcements, actually, that are pretty exciting, but it's making my schedule just weep because uh, I have four cons in August. It's like every weekend I'm gone. But uh, the first one is, for those of you who know, my biggest hero and inspiration in art is Alan Williams, and he is also a, I, I call him a graphite master, but I'm sure he would just call himself a pencil artist and he has a solo gallery in California in August, and alongside of this solo show, he was allowed to ask a handful of hand-picked artists to contribute a piece alongside of him. And I got an email from Vicky, his wife, about a month ago, and I was one of the artists he selected. Now... For me, this is the biggest honor because I don't have an artist that I admire more than Alan. The tricky part is that I have so much going on this summer that I have to squeeze in a new piece alongside everything else. So that's why I've been pretty bad about getting back um, to my Instagram messages. So if you have messaged me on Instagram, I'm sorry. It's just I, I'm really trying to focus on I have like three pieces I need to get done before August. And this isn't even one of them. So this is just outside of that. So that's why I'm really trying to get this piece done um, by next weekend. Or by next week even. I don't, wanna, I don't want this one to go into next weekend. But uh, the theme of his gallery is personal gods. So I have to think of a piece that evokes that feeling. And I've been kind of bouncing a few ideas in my head. I don't want to share anything yet because I don't want to confirm... Uh, the drawing that I'm going with because I'm still not confident in it 100%. You know, sometimes you're given a theme and like you have an idea right away and instantly you know what you're going to draw, how you're going to draw it. But for me with this, I'm, I'm not quite as reassured on my first thought. So that's something I'll probably do live 
on the streams, and I'll show you guys the process of making this piece for Alan. But just know that is something I'm really looking forward to and I really want to flex any creative and graphite technical muscle I have in my body to show Alan he didn't mischoose by selecting me as one of the artists. And I want to do a good job. And the other piece of good news is I was contacted by ImagineFX on Thursday. So literally on my way to Denver Comic Con, I get a message on my Etsy and it was just saying how uh, they, uh, Claire Howard, the editor-in-chief, found me and wants me to do an upcoming workshop for the magazine. And that is something I have been wanting to do since I was a librarian at my college. And every month I would get the new issue of Imagine FX and I would just... I, I just knew that that was going to be one of my goals. I wanted to be in Imagine FX so bad when I was in the library. And I remember making that a, a goal of mine that I wanted to achieve. Man, I'm drawing the dinkiest little lobster crab or claw. I need to make this more intimidating. Oh, well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh, thank you, guys. Yeah, so it's been cool because I've been in Imagine FX for the sketchbook volumes, which has, uh, I've been in three of them now. Which is in honor. I'm not going to try to downplay that. Uh, but my initial goal was to be in the, the monthly magazine. So as cool as it was for me to be in the, the sketch one, I've always wanted to be in the official monthly one. So I, I don't know if I'm even supposed to share too much news about that or like updates or when it's going to happen. But uh, just so you guys know, I wanted you guys to be the first to know actually. I thank you, Sarah Lizzie, for following. Okay, so for this lobster crap, I'm going to have a very dark gradient from the claw going from the tips in. So I'll give you a good example of how I do that with this claw. Now, I'm working with such a sharp point that this actually could be seen as a time waster. I'm going to jump to an HB, and even this tip is pretty blunt. Hold on. Ooh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to cringe right now, but I'm just going to break that because I want more of a flat, large edge so that way I'm not wasting my time rendering. Because if there's something I'm definitely more, or at least actively aware of that I do is I spend a lot of time rendering things that I could do a lot faster. So... If you find yourself in a position like me where you know you can do it faster, do it. I thank you, Haizu, for following. I feel like I get trapped too often in this rendering hole. Me and Sean call it noodling, and I'm just noodling for like two hours. And it could be something as small as this claw. And by the time I'm finished with that two hours, I'm like, I barely even made a difference. I feel like I barely affected the end result of what this looks like. So that's something I've definitely been more conscious of, especially as my time seems to be getting smaller and smaller that I can dedicate to my own work as I'm finally getting to work with these kind of companies and artists that I've admired for years and I've, I cannot pass up the opportunity because I feel like that's been a dream of mine for like eight years, at least for Imagine FX. And then working with Alan, I didn't know what kind of context I would want to work with with Alan in, but I couldn't think of a larger honor than this. So I want to make sure I do a good job and I want to make sure I give myself ample enough time to uh, do a good job. All right. So you can see how rough it looks right now. And that's okay because as I go in and I tighten and I clean up, that's when the magic will start happening. So right now, it still looks really sloppy. And I'm sure if you guys are new to the stream, you're probably like, how the hell does he create anything when his work looks that sloppy? But all of my drawings usually start off a little rougher like this, and then I tighten up as I go. So you'll see how this claw... I wanted to really focus on at least one area so you can see the difference of where it starts versus where it ends. Because I'm still working with a, I, think, I believe it's a HB and a very blunt, large tip. 
but I'm going to be switching to the mechanical pencil, which has a very small 0.2 millimeter uh, size ratio or uh, radius. Is that right? Uh, tip to it. Let me just pull it out. It's the mechanical pencil that I always post in my Instagram story. And it has a very small tip, and that's what gets me inside of those very intricate parts of the detail that I can't quite capture with such a large tool like this. Oops, let me, let me answer some questions really quick. I found, I caught myself rambling. Uh, Sammy says, congrats on both great things. I missed the artist's name though. I would love to look him up. His name is Alan what? It's Alan Williams. And on Instagram, it's at I, and I believe underscore just draw. And I guess to any of you guys out there, if you're making a new username on Instagram, try to avoid uh, periods, underscores, or repeating letters. It can be kind of confusing sometimes for people to find you. But I think since Alan is obviously my hero, I remember that he has an underscore after I. So now here's when you can start to see, okay, I see what he's doing there with the texture and how some of those uh, dots, those freckles that those sea creatures have are starting to come out. Um, <laughs> Arik Siva says, holy Imagine FX, I loved reading those magazines. Yeah, so did I. I think that's why this is something that's pretty big for me. And I want to do a good job. So it's like, not only do I have this Imagine FX project, but I also have this piece for Alan Williams, and then I have to have this piece done, but more than anything, me and Key are hosting Drawtober again this year, so that's 31 drawings, and that's something that I need to actually start early, because hosting it is a challenge in itself, so I will not be able to draw every single day the, the prompt, and I need to do some early, because last year I was not prepared for how many people joined Drawtober, and I was not prepared for 2,000 entries on day one and having to search and look through all of them to repost and make sure we're getting the artist name uh, credited. And that was a nightmare in some regards. I had to actually hire one of my good friends that I had um, before, Deandra, to help out with just Instagram resharing. And then Key took on Twitter. And it was just rough. It was awesome. It was overwhelmingly awesome, but... Uh, I was not ready. So this year I want to be a little more prepared for Drawtober when that happens. And for those of you who have no idea what that is, it's basically like all these monthly challenges you hear about. We, Me and Key did Drawloween two years ago, and then after hearing that they kind of saw it more as a hobby and we wanted to be a little more serious with it, we decided to create our own, which is Drawtober. And we've been gearing up for this year. We created the list... So now we're already like making some thumbnails and I'm really excited to share what I have in store for you guys. I have a lot of, well, I think they're fun. I hope you guys think they're fun, cool ideas because I, I get excited thinking about them. But the only thing I'll share with you guys of why I get excited is because don't expect just graphite from me and that's all I'll say. Why, thank you, Centennial Serenity, for following. Okay. Now I'm going to switch back. Actually, I might just use an H. With more of a fine tip. I always notice after the stream's over, whenever I look at my piece, I'm like, oh man, there's some really rough areas. So then I'll like do some cleanup work afterwards. So I'm trying to be better about cleaning it up as I go. But maybe that's something that, as I have a bad habit of when I start talking, I don't focus entirely on the drawing. I'm like half focused on what I'm saying. And even then I feel like I'm ranting and warbling in different directions. 
Du, du, du. Uh, and Tari's PNG says, so what's your drawing process exactly? I like pencils. Do you use... What pencils do you use for which part? I rarely work with a dark pencil first. So I would say normally you'll see an HB, a 2H, or just an H pencil as I start off my drawings. And then as I go forward, as I'm like wanting to build up detail, then I'll start going a bit darker. But even then, I'm still pushing like maybe an HB. And it's not until I'm pretty confident with how everything looks overall that I'll bring in the big guns of like a 4B or an 8B and really punch just the value. So I'm not trying to look at the whole thing and like darken up everything. I'm only looking at where I think the darkest part should be and then I'm punching those areas a bit darker. Now even with this claw, I really want a nice gradient from dark to light. I think because realism has started to bore me, so I play with contrast quite a bit in my pieces. And in this one specifically, I want the claw to be almost like ridiculously dark. Well, I thank you. Uh, well, I missed the name, but thank you for following. Yeah, something I am noticing with these lights is I'm getting this glare that just cannot be avoided. But I also want there to be some gradation to show form in the claw. So I'm going to make near the outside edge a bit darker. And maybe this is where, no, I'll still stick with a H pencil. And then it kind of creates a lighter tone in the center. Okay, I'm going to pull it. Or you know what? I'll pull the 2B, but I kind of want a sharp one. Usually I'm really good at keeping my pencils organized. Oh, there we go. So whenever the edge may become a little messy like this, I'll just take my mono eraser and erase around the outside edge. I thank you guys for following. So no, even with the top of this, I really like nice clean edges and then build the gradients within. So even like with this top part of the claw, I want there to be that shine. Cause like I was saying, I want it to feel like it has form. Oops, there we go. And then even with these little bumps down here. Just anywhere I can emphasize just little touches of detail. Um, doo -doo -doo. Jocelyn says, did they contact you for the Imagine F sketchbook prior or did you submit? Very exciting news indeed. It sounds like it's going to be a busy year for you. Yeah, indeed. Um, so yes, how did I get into ImagineFX? I submitted a slew of things. Uh, what was it? Man, that had to be like three years ago. And I didn't think I got in. They sent me like a, hey, thanks for submitting, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of just took it as like a defeat letter. Like kind of like when you get a college application, they're like, hey, thank you so much for applying. We had so many talented artists, blah, blah, blah. And uh, just an honor, blah, blah, blah. So I didn't think I got in. And then literally three months later, I get an ImagineFX uh, package in the mail. And I'm like, why? Oh, they probably sent it to me as like a, hey, thanks for submitting. But they didn't take me. And then literally I open it up. And on the inside cover, my art is on there. I'm like, what? Like, what? <laughs> what's happening right now? And then I found out they actually gave me a four-page spread. So it was interesting going from not thinking I made it at all to being on the inside cover alongside a four-page or a four -page spread. I found that pretty intriguing. But uh, that's how I got in initially. And ever since then, they just kind of retake my old work and then put it back in. 
I, I do want to send them new stuff, though, because they've been reusing the stuff I sent them three years ago. I have a lot of new work that could be shown rather than just my, my early work. Or earlier, I should say. Um, and then in terms of this new one, I really wanted to be on the cover of Imagine FX last time I submitted. So I was that very ambitious kid that sent in uh, like thumbnails and ideas of what the cover could look like and what I would give my workshop topic on. And uh, I didn't really hear back. But the way I always took a defeat or a rejection was, hey, I'll give them some time to think about it. I'll try to get a bit better and then I'll send it again. And it's been kind of my mentality my whole life is if I don't get in, I never see it as a defeat. It's just uh, I'll keep working at it to do better next time. And I hope that that's something that I can pass along to you guys if you are also curious about like getting into a, a drawing magazine or maybe you have a different goal, like making it into a studio of some sort. I think you can't just take that initial rejection as a forever rejection. That doesn't mean that you're not good enough ever. That just means right now your skills might not be where they need to be. And you can't just expect everyone to always say yes to you. I think that's something I talk about with my roommates and my family a lot about how this next generation, when I teach them, <coughs> I think they've been giving, given so many back pats and so many good jobs and you're doing great and A+. Plus and trophies for things that they don't deserve trophies in. So it's almost like they expect things to be handed to them. So the idea of a rejection is new. It's so foreign to them that it can be crushing and devastating. But I think the way I grew up, I just, I've, I've been rejected from so many things, even growing up at an early age. I lost so many art contests. And even as an adult, I've lost lots of art contests and even outside of just art uh, I got rejected for sports teams I've been uh, like a runner-up to a bunch of things and you learn from them I don't think winning all the time allows you to grow as a person let alone an artist and I think that's something that you gotta get used to so don't see rejection as this negative thing see it as an opportunity to grow and learn to get better Ooh. Sorry if I sound preachy from time to time. I think it's just because I want to help so bad with artists that were in a similar situation I was in. And I think sometimes you have to pull back and realize, hey, just because you're being rejected, just because they have an opinion that's different than what you know you are looking for, doesn't mean that you're less than or they're less than. It's just they might not be what you're looking for and you're, you might not be what they're looking for. Okay, let me work on... The other thing I'm going to do is create a really dark antenna here. Just so that really light body stands out underneath of it. If you can see how I have so many lines, it's kind of conflicting upon itself. So I'm just going to erase a lot of these. There we go. You can see how all of a sudden I have that contrast of the whisker being really dark and then the body underneath being really light. And that's basically how I have fun with drawing is I look for those areas where I can get away with this kind of contrast and this value play. But do you see this horrible tangent right here? I'm going to edit that <laughs> so that we don't have this obnoxious tangent right there. And if you ever recognize a tangent in your work, try to fix it right away. Don't try to just let it free fall because it will stand out like a plague. And not just to you, but to the viewer. There we go. Now I am noticing that this is pretty dark of a claw. Like the rest of the drawing doesn't have as many dark spots. 
So to pull this much attention up here, it's kind of unnecessary. And if I was honest with you, a bit distracting. But this is sometimes what happens when I, I stream, I don't see the whole picture. Or I guess not even when I just stream, but just when I'm drawing and I'm not taking the moment to step back every now and then. So maybe I'll lighten this up just a touch. And the way I normally do it is I just take my kneaded eraser and I'll just dab on the drawing and it'll lift some of that graphite up. And honestly, this is why I work with a 2H almost primarily for the whole drawing early on, because that allows me to lay out the foundation for the drawing, and then I can go in and add value. So I think for the rest of the stream, I'm going to do my best not to switch over to a darker pencil, because I don't want to create this odd composition then that I have to fix later on. I can still create value and intensity with just a 2H. I think people assume that because it's lighter, you still can't create contrast, but all of the fish that I've created here, that's done with a 2H. And then there, you can tell where I started using a darker pencil, but you can see all of a sudden that really draws your attention there. And not just because of the white horn in front of it, but because of how dark that is. So as I go through with the rest of the animals, I want to be very careful with how I'm laying those values. Okay, so now I'm a lobster. It's got these little whiskers going up. Like that. Same on this side. And now the toughest part about something like this is to mirror it the way that we did it on the other side. And lobsters I always found interesting because I used to work at a seafood restaurant and I would pass this giant tank of them all the time and I remember there was this one lobster that was just huge and no one would ever order it because it was too expensive. And I would just kind of like say hi to it every morning as I would pass it. And it was kind of sad though, actually. It didn't really move much. It was so big that the tank couldn't even accommodate it. And I think that's kind of when I started realizing, uh, this was before I was even vegetarian, but that's when I kind of started realizing like this isn't a life. And I feel like we are the problem of that. And I think a lot of these are just personal opinions, and obviously I'm not going to just preach what I believe to you guys, but it's something that definitely made me reconsider not only working at the seafood restaurant, but what I, what I eat in general. But anyways, this giant lobster was so big that you could see all the detail on his claws, and he actually started growing those little, uh, oh, what are those called? It's not coral, but those little, not urchins. Oh, I can't remember what they're called right now. But he had them kind of littered all over one side of his body, and especially on the claw. And that was around the time that Bioshock came out. So for me, it was this really cool amalgamation of all these interesting underwater textures that started inspiring me to go more texture heavy. And I think, like probably many of you that played video games, Bioshock had a huge influence on the way I incorporated texture into my pieces and all of a sudden anything that had texture had more character it was like a a character in itself where all of a sudden you would look at a character but then if you saw a character that was worn distressed and had scars and had beaten up or maybe had sea urchins on them like in Bioshock they had all these like underwater textures growing out of them they just become way more interesting for the the viewer and uh, there's more intrigue for the player so I think that's something that really stuck with me as I started designing characters. The other thing that's nice about an HB or 2H is I feel like I have more control. I definitely feel like I am 
more, oh, sorry, I have to like concentrate as I do this arm here. Sometimes when I mirror things, I have to be very much in concentration because I don't want to do things twice if I don't have to. As my roommate Gabe would always say, work smarter, not harder. So if I can lay out a really good foundation first, then I won't have to waste so much time fixing it and editing it. And it's funny, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I look at animals, I always think I have a good idea of how to draw them, and like if I was to do it blind. But then you do the blind animal challenge, like we did here a few months ago, and you realize how much you really may not know about the way an animal looks. And I always find that funny uh, when I'm given an animal that I, I've seen, you know, hundreds of times, but then when I go to draw it, it's just blank. It is just something rough. I remember we did a giraffe, and my giraffe was looking really rough. Oh, no, it was a flamingo. We had to draw a flamingo. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, I, I think I know what a flamingo looks like. And then I go to draw it, and I'm like, this is not what a flamingo looks like. I'm going to make this claw beefier, too. Whenever there's an excuse to draw like a bigger claw, why not draw a bigger claw? There we go. Oh, you guys can barely even see it. I'm sorry. Barnacles. Thank you, Mitten. Or Mitten. I mean, that's going to be something I'll never be able to get over. <laughs> um, PNG says, do you ever use a tortillion or do you just build up with the pencil? Are you talking about the, um, the paper shaders? Uh, no, I only use the pencil. Uh, Jocelyn says, wow, what an amazing surprise to see your art on four pages. I wonder how many artists thought the same thing you did with no clear answer. I know I was thinking that too. I was like, am I the only artist that didn't actually know they were getting into the magazine? Uh, Jelly says, do you have the four pages framed somewhere? Uh, I don't. My parents have uh, the magazine and they want to frame it and do it all right. Uh, but no, I do keep all the books and magazines that I've been featured in in a special area in my library. And I say library, but it's just two bookshelves. Fake it till you make it, right? Uh, Wix D says, hey, Vaughn, how are you? Just out of work. Did I miss anything? Um, I'm being a little shellfish on the stream, and I'm drawing some lobsters and crabs. So you didn't really miss much. You missed me ranting a little bit, but uh, just on how you can't take a rejection as an ultimatum. You know, you just got to see it as a chance to rise up and meet the challenge. Du, du, du. Um, Jan says, how was Incredibles 2? Okay, so I guess if we want to talk some movies, because for those of you who know me, I, I try to watch a new movie every day. Why, well, thank you, Omine for following. Omine? Omine for following. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I'm a huge movie lover. I love film. And I feel like if I didn't go into art or something with biology, I would be a, a film reviewer or a film critiquer. Not because I'm one that just likes to slander on movies. I think maybe my early 20s, and I think that's when a lot of, I don't know about you guys, I think that's where a lot of us get headstrong. And it's like nothing is, uh, everything is just bad. And no one can see the inefficiencies or the, the lack of quality or blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's just, it becomes very easy to rip on things when you're looking for things to rip on. But now that I've, I've grown quite a bit and matured in terms of how I look at movies and how I recommend them to people and how I review them. Oh, thank you, Spectre. Oh, we put some cheers in the... Oh, they're fish! Or no, it's a dog. <laughs> Why did I think it was a fish? Um, thank you. So, uh, I'm a lot better about giving movie reviews i think before like movies that i know wouldn't be for me so like a superhero movie or pacific rim any type of those movies where they're just blockbusters i'm not their target market 
And I think if they're entertaining people and they walk away with people being entertained, that movie did its job. But the movies that I get really excited for, the movies that I, I look for, are the ones that make you leave the theater questioning, one, what did I just watch? Two, maybe my morals and the way that I'm living my life is now in question because of what I just viewed. And three, do I agree or disagree with the decisions that were made in this movie because they are not so black and white? And I think a lot of modern American filmmaking has this bad habit of treating the audience like they can't keep up or like they need extra pointers or they need to be showing uh, the, the people watching clues on how they should feel, uh, what they should pick up on so that they can pick up all the pieces of the puzzle so that by the end you have this nice complete puzzle. But the movies I like, they're like, uh, here's maybe a quarter of the puzzle, it's up to you to fill in the, the gaps. And I love those movies because then it almost allows interpretation to take over. And then you talk with someone that saw the exact same movie, you could be leaving the theater and have a completely different opinions and views of what you just watched. And I think that definitely happened last year with me when watching Mother. But unfortunately, I think that movie got such bad reviews and a reputation because of how much shock value is included but for me I, it's very easy for me to look past that because i can see or at least my interpretation it felt deeper than just the surface value of what you were seeing on screen a lot of physical actions that were taking place to me were metaphors so i don't i didn't see it as that shocking except in maybe a couple scenes that i was like okay yeah you just did that and that's going to anger a lot of people and I think that's going to go, it's, they're totally going to miss the point now because of what you just shown was so graphic that that's what they're going to walk away with rather than the metaphor of what that's supposed to mean. Anyways, uh, on to Incredibles 2. Yes, I I thought it was fun. Um, I, I don't think it was as strong as the first one. In terms of the quality of the look and animation, I mean, by far, like leagues above the first one. And I think that's something that we've come to expect from any modern animation film. The lighting, the animation, and the overall quality of how it feels should be top-notch. And it's kind of unfortunate where you see some of these smaller studios get reprimanded because they're not able to match that level for an entire film of an animation. But then you watch movies like My Life as a Zucchini, and you're like, you know, sometimes you don't need the super realistic finer texture cloths or lighting simulators to create a memorable movie and one that is worth rewatching over and over. So for me, this one was not one of those movies, unfortunately. But I think you'll have fun with it if you're going. If you want to have fun at a movie theater, this is definitely the movie for you. And I think the, the baby will be your favorite part because they really play the joke with the baby and my roommate key i mean she loved it there were moments i could just hear her uh gut laughing and <laughs> um it was one of those where i i think i might have enjoyed the short before the movie i thought it was a really cute touching but i feel like that's pixar shorts in general now they just seem to be so so tight and it's a good word it's like a complete package you're reading three to five minutes of a very easy to understand story, but typically without words, which is my favorite type of story. And it kind of allows you to experience the feelings that the characters are feeling rather than them telling you how to feel. And uh, I think with the feature film, it's just, it's a wild fun ride and it's very relatable to the other superhero movies out um, today. So if you like superhero movies, I definitely would go recommend seeing this. Right, let me focus on this claw just for a second here. Because if I'm going to get the crabs in here as well, i got to start working faster, right? Um, Caroline says, so your stuff is finally making it onto your parents' fridge. <laughs> kind of. I'm still not on the fridge, though. I'm on their wall. So maybe this is like a step closer to being on the fridge. And for those of you who don't know, it's because I've never been on my parents' fridge. My art never was on my parents' fridge. I remember that being like a small goal as a child that I never 
achieved. And I think I just kept working harder and harder. Uh, I, you know what's funny is I didn't even mention it to them. So like maybe for them, they didn't even realize how bad I wanted to be on the fridge. But I, I guess that made me work harder. <laughs> it made me push myself. And I think that just carried over into my adult years. Uh, Jan is saying, what was your main job before you started doing this for a living? I was a teacher with CG Cookie for, I think it was six years. And I loved my job. It was actually one of those things where you don't hear about it too often where you where an artist really enjoys what they did. But I realized I was fighting for my time more than I was fighting for a paycheck. And something that even my boss at CG Cookie, Wes Burke, who is one of my, I would say my, one of my top influencers in my life, he said, never work for a paycheck. And I remember that being very prominent to me because I felt like it was easy for me to agree with that because I was getting paid and uh, my, my bills were being paid and I didn't have to worry so much about money. But after a while, you realize life is not this complete package of you have a nine to five, you buy a house, you get married, you have kids, and then you watch them grow, they have kids, and then you die. And I think that was sold to me so early at my my or it wasn't when I was growing up that I kind of assumed I would always have a full-time job the thought of not having a full-time job didn't even cross my mind until like four years ago and the reason for that was because I started getting that itch of is this it and it was really depressing actually I don't know if it was just because it was that time in my life I think a lot of us go through that in their mid-20s maybe even early like 23 to 26 When you start to question, is this all I'm going to be doing the rest of my life? And that's a scary question because then you might realize I'm just going to be working nine to five for the rest of my life to pay off either school loans, to pay off the mortgage, my rent, whatever it might be for you guys. And it can get kind of depressing. And I remember I kept working out of fear because then you're also hit with this weird realization that you can't leave. You've built up so many things like a mortgage or utility bills that they have to be paid. And if you're not working, how are they going to be paid? So this is one of those instances where I actually loved my job, but I left it because I wanted my time back. And because I was working so heavily outside of um, CG Cookie on like branding my own stuff and doing cons, I was able to take the leap. And that's why, for me, it may have been a little easier because I was able to establish more of a presence online. But I I give a lot of people credit that do it without a safety net under them because I think it takes a lot of bravery to leave it and then it takes a lot of work and a tenacity to push through. So if you're, you feel like you're kind of stuck in that bubble, I've been there. And it took me two years to make the decision to finally quit And hindsight now, it's been interesting, and I can tell you guys this because I I trust you guys, but uh, I'm actually making more money now than I did with my full-time job. And it's one of those ironic hindsight situations where you look back and think, why didn't I do this sooner? And it's because it's scary. That's why. And you don't know how you're going to take care of yourself. And then it becomes even harder when you start to have a family or a relationship or if there's a medical issue. So I don't recommend everyone to take the leap of faith of leaving a full-time job, pursue an independent lifestyle. Instead, I recommend people to take a look at their journey and figure out how can I make the leap so that I have somewhat of a net underneath me that I can rely on. Because I think having no net is is very risky, and I think you can put yourself in more trouble um, than you may realize. So I always say try to build up some kind of a net beforehand. But you can do it. If there's anyone to be a prime example, I'm a small kid from a small town in Wisconsin, and I didn't even know what Photoshop was till 19. Heck, I didn't even really know. I was such a bubble school kid like all my friends were kind of these well-off uh sons and daughters of wealthy people 
Um, but my family wasn't really that wealthy. In fact, I was more on the lower end. Uh, and I think that's taught me a lot about how I see money and how I can recognize when I'm reckless with money versus when I'm saving and good with money. Like right now, I feel I'm pretty good with money. But it took me years of recognizing how bad I was at it and how much little savings can do for you in the long run. And it could be something as simple as not ordering a drink at a restaurant. It's like when I go to Subway, I don't do the meal deal. I just get the sub. And it goes from $8 to $5 every week. And that's $3 per week. That's $12 per month. And once you add it all up, that could be like $150 per year just on not ordering a drink when I go to Subway. And I think that's one thing I want to recommend to you guys too is you can definitely leave your full-time job, but you have to make a lot of little sacrifices in terms of what you're spending. And once you realize, okay, I just need to look at the essentials of what I have and focus on spending money on those alone. And anything else is a luxury that I cannot afford right now. And until I get my feet more grounded, I'm not even going to consider it an option to buy uh, anything. And I think that's what I did earlier this year. And I realized how much money I can save. And I'm like, oh my gosh, why wasn't I doing this when I had a full-time job? So be a little more aware of how you're spending your money and how much little purchases add up. Because in our mind, a $5 purchase may not seem like much, but if you do that four times a week, it could be something little like just getting a candy bar at a gas station. It adds up. Why, thank you, King Bryasaur, for following. Do, do, do. Uh, Sudi says, did you like Annihilation? I loved Annihilation. I think that so far is my favorite movie of the year in terms of a new release. And for those of you who don't know what Annihilation is, it's a, I believe it came out in February, and it stars Natalie Portman. It's by the director of Ex Machina. And it stars actually... Uh, the guy from Star Wars, and he was also in Ex Machina. And I went into it not knowing anything. I I saw the poster with like the bubble sphere, and I saw Natalie Portman. And I liked Ex Machina a lot. I didn't love it completely. I would say I liked it a lot, though. And I, I loved how it was shot. I thought it was very well-crafted. And I thought there were a lot of very smart decisions made throughout that movie. But for Annihilation... I left the theater with like my mouth open. I was such in awe of the ideas that were explored and how they executed it visually. Now, I know this was an adapted screenplay off of a book. So, yeah, for those of you who have read the book, this was probably no surprise for you. And I can't just give credit to the director or the writer because... It was adapted from the original book. So I give a lot of credit to the guy that wrote the book, and my roommate Jonas uh, read the book and follows that guy and says how he uh, is just this really cool, interesting person. So it definitely comes through in the movie <laughs> in the way that uh, what you see is very intriguing. But if you're an artist watching this, that's definitely a movie I would recommend for this year because of the visuals alone. There are some movies out there that I would recommend, not because I think it was, you know, quality storytelling or I thought the actors did a good job, but sometimes visually it's just so stimulating that I, I would find it hard-pressed not to recommend it to an artist. And I think the first example that comes to my mind is actually A Cure for Wellness. That came out, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago, but it was directed by Gore Verbinski, and it has Dane DeHaan, so if you guys like him, um, he is the main character in the film, but I, I actually thought he did kind of a rough job with it. This, the look of the movie, though, is so good. If there was ever, like, color palette the movie, it would be called Cure for Wellness because they not only picked their color palette and, like, they showed it pretty early on, but the whole movie, you felt it. And I, I give them a lot of credit. So whoever designed that, very well done. Now, I'm going to actually move on to the crab because I'm not going to darken this because, like I said, I want to work with the 2H primarily throughout the whole drawing before I move on to darkening things up. And I may do that on a Friday stream. So let me pull up some references of a crab for me here. I'm going to do a brown crab on the top. 
Maybe I'll do a little bigger. Oh, that's right. I got to fit his claw in though. So let me see. Let me do a quick rough sketch here. And for yeah, for those of you who don't know, I am I love movies, so I can kind of ramble when I start talking about movies. So I'm sorry in advance if I start just going. Um, I think it's something that I just get, I get very easily excited about. I guess a good example was, uh, in terms of talking film, if any of you have seen The Fall, that is definitely in my top three favorite movies. And regardless of if you like the story or not, that's another movie where the visuals alone will carry you through, especially if you're an artist. Don't look up in a trailer, though, for it. The trailers, I feel like, do a really weak job uh, at kind of displaying the movie and kind of spoils it. I don't, I don't know if you guys feel the same way about this, but I hate when a trailer kind of just spoils what the movie will be. And it indicates what you're going to expect. And I don't know if that's just because the producers want to sell tickets and they want people to get an idea of what they're buying before they get into it, but it drives me nuts. <laughs> so whenever there's a movie that I want to see, I don't watch the trailer. And it's kind of sad because... I use, I mean, I love obviously movies, so I watch every trailer that comes out on my YouTube. I, I check it every day, like at least twice, just looking for new movie trailers. And if there's a movie by a director I know I like, so if it's like a Wes Anderson or a, what's the, who's another director that I'm like, absolutely, I will not watch. Oh, Aronofsky or uh, Charlie Kaufman, I will not watch a trailer. Instead, I'll just wait for the movie, and I try to experience it as uh, an experience. Because oftentimes, their their films are experiences for me, not just like a fun night at, out of, on the movies, you know? And I'm sure you guys have that too with uh, certain genres or certain movies or directors where you know you're going to enjoy it because they fancy a lot of things you do, or because you like the subject matter that is typically brought up or the conversations that are usually brought up or it could even be in like the style of directing I think there's a few directors who I don't know them by name and I feel embarrassed but the guy that directed the sacred killing of a deer or even the lobster those are the same director I can't remember who what his name is though um, but I know whatever movie he does it's gonna be weird it's gonna be very thought-provoking and it's going to be uh, interpretive. And I love that. And I know without even need, needing to know like what the movie is going to be about, that his movie is going to be very weird and interpretive. And I love that. Like, Give me more of those type of movies because I could watch those all day. All right, let me kind of outline this crab here. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to rendering this crab here. Oh, let's see here. Uh, Fem says, maybe paint a golden fridge on your parents' wall, goal achieved. <laughs> right, and then just put my drawing over that. Uh, Sammy says, I just watched Annihilation the other day because you mentioned how much you enjoyed it and all I have to say is, wow, the visual imagery really stuck in my head for days after and the strange scene in the lighthouse still haunts me, just whoa. Yeah, I, I, I'm so, actually, that makes me really pleased to hear that you uh, took my recommendation. It's one of those things where I, I get so excited by film that I want peop, other people, especially artists, to watch some of the ones that I feel affect me on such a level. So the fact that you actually watched it makes me feel like I was able to pass on what that movie tried to show to people and just... I was like an ambassador for it. I was like, it's Bigot's fan. And they're like, go see it, go see it. Because I want more films like that to be made. I, I don't have like a, a campaign against the movies being made nowadays. But in my, you know, in the back of my head, I'm kind of like, I wish there were more original stories being told nowadays. Or I wish everything just wasn't a cash grab at what people are familiar with. And I think oftentimes sequels and the superhero movie fatigue right now that's going on, I... I feel it, and I don't 
that's part of the reason I don't see superhero movies anymore. And I refuse to go see them in the theater. Oop. Actually, I'm going to put that claw a little higher. Uh, yeah, Sudi, exactly. That's I think that's why it doesn't do well in theaters, because it's so different and unfamiliar to the average moviegoer that when people want go to the movies, oftentimes they want to relax, they want to escape reality. So I understand why there are movies like the superhero movies nowadays, or I, I bring up Pacific Rim because I just, I feel like that's become a joke with me and my roommates of how much I'm not fond of Pacific Rim, but it, it's to entertain and people go there to escape life. So then when you're presented a movie that challenges you in a sense, in the way that you think, or that's something brand new or visually you've never seen before, it can be a bit much for people. And they're like, I just wanted a, a relaxing night out. I didn't want to question my morality or my humanity <laughs> when watching a movie. And I, I have to respect that too. I think if I was younger, I would a bit put up more of a fight for it. But now that I'm older, I realize, hey, if you want more original movies to be seen, just get the word out. Like, Tell people the movies that you see that you like and why you like them, and hopefully that'll stimulate them to go see these kind of different type of movies. And that's why I'm I'm glad that uh, movies like Lady Bird gets recognition because otherwise I don't think people would have seen it. And I, I really wish it would have won Best Picture, but uh, I'm I'm at least glad that it gets acknowledgement. Same with like Call Me by Your Name or Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Like there's a lot of movies that I'm glad that they at least get recognition because then they get seen. And I think having a higher level of quality in terms of storytelling and writing and shots, uh, composition, uh, I, I, I just want to encourage that more. So by recommending these movies that really seem to have a, a push for that to be something that's important to the filmmaker and something that they want. You can just tell it's like a passion project. Uh, those are the movies that I want to recommend to people. Not every now and then, you know, a blockbuster is solid. And I'm not just going to, you know, say every every blockbuster is a bad movie because I don't think that's true at all. But I do think a lot of them go for uh, easy to understand and a plot that's easy di to digest. Oh, actually, another uh, director that I would highly recommend but is super weird, and I could definitely understand if you don't like his movie, but it's uh, Hodorowski. He did the very infamous now Holy Mountain, but I I think he's great. I think, actually, his newer films are a bit more grounded, even, where Holy Mountain, it's, it's very trippy. So if you're not into those type of movies, I do not recommend that. But some of his newer ones, like The Dance of Reality, I think have a little more roots in reality it definitely plays with uh this kind of imaginative world and retelling of his life but i would definitely recommend that one as well oh uh, let's see here um jan says i took your advice on watching it without the trailer i loved it also what are your thoughts on i tanya uh i tanya was great you know what's funny is I told my roommates that I wanted to see this because I was kind of one of those people that already knew everything about this story. I've watched like at least two documentaries on the I or Tanya Harding story, and I've watched like the interviews with uh, her and uh, Nancy. So I I kind of went into this knowing the whole plot, but the way that they shot it and making it like this mockumentary, not completely, but it was shot in that same style of a documentary. But it, it felt comedic enough where it almost felt like a mockumentary. To me, I enjoyed it a lot. And my roommates really loved it. Uh, I think it, it ran a little long. And I don't know if uh, Margot Robbie fully pulled off what Tanya Harding was. Because I think what you saw when you watched the movie was a very... Like, Margot Robbie's so beautiful. I think it's hard to relate her to this real-life person and if you hear tanya talk about herself she's very very poor had a very 
kind of rough attitude about her. And I don't know if that was entirely uh, displayed, but I think she did an excellent job at what she did. I just don't know if she had the right look for Tanya Harding. Now, I will say the ending of that movie, I don't want to give away too much. And I don't feel like this is a spoiler, is it? No, I don't think it's a spoiler. Because if you know the story, you knew that she, in the end, got banned from sk- figure skating. And the, the, the monologue that she gives to the judge, I actually started tearing up because it basically encapsulated the idea that everything that you are passionate about in terms of whatever your career is to have that being taken away from you is kind of like you dying. And I think as an artist, how can you not relate to that? Where if someone tells you, you can never publish or draw again. And if you do draw your works, you cannot post them anywhere online. You can't even show them to people. And it's just, it's devastating to really think about the context of what the judgment call was for Tanya to not skate and have that be literally the only thing that you knew how to do your whole life to have that ripped away from you, uh, was devastating. So I would, I would recommend that movie. It's something that you can definitely draw in the background too. I think some of the ice skating shots were very well done, but besides that, I think it's one of those movies you can easily draw alongside too. Um, I try to recommend movies for artists that you either should pay full attention to because of how visually stimulating is, or if it's just really well written, I think that's one of those movies you can draw to because then you don't have to be like fully focused the whole time. As an artist, I know how tough it can be to watch new movies when you also want to finish a new piece. So I think that's something I'm going to make a habit on the stream whenever I talk about movies is to also say if it's a movie that's worth watching on its own or if it's one that you can watch um, in the background. Um, Yes, I love Aronofsky. And yeah, same with Blade Runner 2048. Uh, Lights and Sea says, how does uh, Del Toro go from Pacific Rim to Shape of Water? You know, it's interesting where I had such a stink with Pacific Rim before that I've learned to make it almost a joke for me and I kind of laugh it off. But I think the reason I was so bothered by it is because Pan's Labyrinth, he he wrote that movie. And I I definitely consider Pan's Labyrinth one of those like high high quality movies and watching it again now i you can definitely tell some of the digital effects are a bit aged and they didn't age super well but in terms of everything else i i still think it's a very very good example of dark fantasy done very very well and i still consider pan the the fawn in the movie to be one of the best creature designs i've ever seen and i think a lot of a lot of you can agree with me on that because not only do you get one excellently designed creature but then you get the pale man with the guy with the eyes and the hands and actually no though i would say those are the two that stand out the fairies were pretty good but i i would definitely put pale man and um pan as monumental success in terms of designing uh, creatures so to go from that in this very like intricate story of uh the girl and bouncing between reality and creating a fantasy that kind of mirrors what's happening in reality. And it's be very dark and it'd be very real. Um, even though you have these fantastical whimsical things happening on, uh, I just thought it was done so well. So to go from that to Pacific Rim, which was literally just like giant robots fighting. Ah, and my roommates love it. So whenever we get in discussion about it, uh, I, I used to kind of knock on them a bit. But I've learned, like I said, I've matured to be like, you know what, if they enjoyed the movie and they were entertained by it, it did its job. And you know what, maybe Del Toro was just having fun with it, and he didn't care if it was going to like stimulate the brain on whether or not uh, it's interpretive, or if you can walk away you know, questioning life and you see it in a new light. Maybe that's something that when he was a kid giant robots were his way of escaping reality and he wanted to give that back to 
the next generation. So I've learned to not be so critical when people like a movie that I thought was underwhelming. Instead, I try to discuss um, movies with people. And now that's become like my one of my new favorite things in the past like five years. So I guess it's not really new, but I guess if you guys, this is your first time at the stream, uh, that's I guess something you can know about me. I will talk about movies all day if you let me. <laughs> I watch reviews on movies while I'm drawing. I uh, I just, I love them so much. And I'm so glad I don't work in the movie industry because then I feel like a lot of that magic would be lost for me. And I feel like when I'm watching a movie, I would see things that most people aren't normally supposed to see or think about. Like, I don't know if you guys know this in uh, spoilers if you don't want to hear something that may ruin your movie experience. But I learned that every sentence in the big movies when people are speaking yeah they have a boom mic and everything but they actually re-record every line of dialogue in a movie um after the movie's over so when you're watching a movie when you hear someone talking they're not actually they are talking on set but what you're hearing is actually the re-record that they do in the studio and i always thought that was really interesting and that bothered me for a little bit because <laughs> anytime something takes me out of the movie like i want to get lost in it i just want a movie to completely sweep me away and I, it's very easy for me to get swept away into something. So whenever I'm taking, taken out of it, it really bothers me. So that's why when a movie takes me out on its own plot or storytelling, I get so frustrated. And I think a prime example was with Jurassic World last year. And if you like Jurassic World, I'm definitely game to discuss that with uh, you on here. But the, the thing that really bothered me most, and it's not even the high heels, it was when... The super dinosaur was in the cage, and uh, they thought that it escaped. So rather than... I, their first reaction was to send a team of people inside of this cage, which a dinosaur may or may not be in, to check if it's uh, still in there, even though we learn later in the movie that every dinosaur has a tracking device in it, and you can tell where the dinosaur is, and you can tell where the mega dinosaur was because they found the tracking device and that's how they were able to find the dinosaur. So that means the tracking device was inside of the dinosaur still when the dinosaur went missing or when it camouflaged itself. So it took me so out of the movie because I'm like, that's such a plot hole. Like you literally have tracking devices in and you're not going to check that. You're not going to go see the tracking device monitor and where the dinosaur is. And I, I just, whenever a movie does that, I get so taken out and I get bothered. And I think that's where uh, my friends like to poke fun at me because I I, th I get so bothered by it that I like I need to express it after the movie's over and be like, ah, didn't that bother you guys? And how could how did no one on set think of that? And how do they not have a someone just being like, hey, I think we should rewrite this part or, you know, it doesn't really make sense. So anyways, <laughs> that's my relationship with movies, is I love them, but I'm equally uh, critical of, of them, because I want to see them be the best that they can be. And I don't know about you guys, but I definitely feel like American movies has become a bit formulaic over the last 10 years. I was just watching uh, a video this morning on the difference between let the right one in which was the polish film and let me in which was the american remake done a couple years later and let me in or let the right one in is one of my favorite horror movies or I, get, I don't even know if it's a horror movie per se but definitely my favorite vampire movie and it's one that i watch every halloween or every october and uh they made an american version by the guy that directed cloverfield and this video did a really good job of explaining why they're so opposite, even though they're telling the same story, and why the Polish one is done so well, and it's crafted in a way that makes you fill in the gaps, and they tell a, a story between characters that feel there's depth within the characters, and their motivations feel realized. Where then you look at the American one, and a lot of it is just it's directed to an audience that doesn't want to think. And I, I, my, the first time I saw Let Me In, 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you guys have even seen these movies, but uh, the first time I saw it, I was thinking, yeah, this is a pretty good retelling. I definitely like the other one way better. But I think the use of color and uh, the at least a lot of the acting by the main boy was done very well. But after hearing their um, reasons why it really isn't as good, it made me re appreciate the original and then look at the new one in a different light and i don't know it's interesting for me that american studios don't try to impress on like a originality scale because then you have a movie like frozen come out and yeah, even though it's kind of a rehashing of other stories, it's still considered an original movie, and it did so well. Or I, mean, I guess look at the other ones that are a little different, like Wreck-It Ralph or uh, Big Hero 6, and they do very well. But then you get way more sequels and preludes and rehashes that no one wants, and <laughs> it bothers me. And I feel like now I'm just I'm digging a hole because I get so frustrated sometimes with the movie industry. But I just, I just want to see more original content. I guess that's the what I'm trying to get to here. Um, Ariex Siva says, Pacific Rim is a movie Del Toro has to make to get Freeway to make his passion products. They are a means to an end. I have heard that as well. But you can kind of tell when he talks about it, like he's having fun. And I'm not going to knock a person for if that's really their passion project. I am, I'm just not the target demographic. And for the people that do love giant robot movies, I think that they did it. He did a good job for them. I, I rarely hear people be like, Oh, but did it really stimulate my thought pattern on whether I think the fighting was worth the end result? Like, no, they just want to see giant robots punching the hell out of these giant creatures and if, they, if I can give anything to Pacific Rim, I'll give the creature designs credit because they were done by Alan Williams, and I think the kaiju are excellent. Uh, Tizzle, hey Tizzle, how are you doing? Says, my dad is watching you right now. No pressure. Oh boy. Well, hello, Mr. Tizzle. <laughs> uh, Wufu Me says, I think you'll like Synecdoche, New York. That is my favorite movie. Oh, that's so funny that you can get that um, just out of the way I'm talking. Maybe because I, I sound so presumptuous and uh, cynical. I don't mean to, but I love Synecdoche, New York. Um, I don't know if that's actually one I would recommend, though. I think a lot of people would actually hate it. Uh, not because I think that they wouldn't understand it, but I think they wouldn't... They would... Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that's a movie I can freely recommend. But I will say that if that's not my favorite movie, because The Fall might be my favorite movie, it's definitely in my top three, along with Spirited Away. So, I think Sing Act New York is genius. And maybe try to just watch it with an open mind and realize what is going on is very much a metaphor. And that time passing is the theme of the movie. So, like, one scene might be halloween and then within that same scene time will jump to like getting close to christmas but it's set in the same kitchen and it's trying to and this is don't worry this isn't a spoiler or anything but it's trying to show how fast time passes and you can blink an eye and not realize a month has gone by and nothing's really changed you're still doing the same actions you're in this routine that you're you've kind of become or it's become habitual for you and you don't even recognize that time is slipping away and you're not making the most of it so that movie it speaks to me on so many levels but it's hard for me to recommend that to people like i wouldn't be like yeah i would even recommend that to my parents because i think i don't think they would like it (laughs) um but for you guys i definitely would recommend at least giving it a try if you hate it i'm sorry but if you love it uh just know i'm in that same boat and we can love it together (laughs) Uh, Jim sees, I think every movie after the original JP has ultimately ruined what made the original so compelling. That being A, technology, 
left unchecked can lead to all sorts of problems. And B, dinosaurs are scary. AF, I saw it when I was 10 in my hands. Oh, Jurassic Park. Yeah. No, I thought the original did a much better job. I like Jurassic Park. And, you know, I, I'm i still a fan of... Um, I don't know if they were... I guess they were giant puppets. One of them definitely was. But practical effects, I, I don't know if it's because I grew up with them, but I still think they hold a higher weight than digital effects. And you see it more and more. It's become kind of a trend, especially with Mad Max kind of turning the wheel on what you can do with practical versus digital and how much better it can look. Then all of a sudden you see Star Wars kind of returning to its roots with a lot of puppetry again. And even, I mean, I'm hoping with a new Jim Henson Labyrinth movie that they keep a lot of the practicalness of it rather than just switching to digital. Because oftentimes digital kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, takes me out of the movie experience. And I'm, I can't get lost in that world because I don't, I don't believe it. I don't believe I'm there. Where a practical effect, like you can get a sense of it being real because of the way that it moves, the way that it's capturing and reflecting light. It feels real. Do, do, do. Oh, yes, I love let the right one in. Oh, Caroline says, if you had to make a choice, book or movie, uh, I know I'm going to be, this sounds super American, but movie. Uh, it's hard for me to focus on a book long enough without feeling like I am wasting time. And I know that sounds terrible, but it's because with a movie, a lot of the times I'm drawing alongside the movie. So I feel like even if I pay like 60% attention to the movie, I can still experience it while still getting work done. But with a book, I mean, you really have to dedicate like 100% of your time and attention to it. So I wish I would have read more as a kid when I wasn't so obsessed with time and trying to get as much done as I can in that time. But uh, it was funny, at the airport when we were coming back from Denver, I actually bought a book and I read for a while because I, I definitely can um, get transported into the world that the book's trying to create. I think sometimes for me it's motivation to actually sit down, put everything else aside, and just escape into the book. And unfortunately, I guilt myself nowadays because my, my time seems so limited. Uh, Maria, hey Maria, says, Have you ever watched the YouTuber Cinnamon Sins? He does everything wrong with and points out all the plot holes in movies. It's hilarious. Yeah, I love... Um, I love watching reviews of movies, especially when they kind of like poke fun, but in, not in like a playful way. When a movie reviewer just does it in like a very hateful way, it makes me uncomfortable. But if they can kind of poke fun at it, I think that's where I, I enjoy it. My favorite movie reviewer, though, of all time is, his name is YMS. It's <laughs> it's Your Movie Sucks, but uh, the way he talks about movies, it just feels like he's really putting m so much thought into every detail of a movie. And when a movie just falls very short he just he rips on them and it's comical for me but sometimes I think he goes a little far but he's very blunt and honest which I love because I think a lot of the reviewers that I also watch like Grace Randolph on um oh I'm forgetting what the movie channel is called on YouTube uh, I can't remember it but Grace or even Chris Stuckman I think they kind of give like the passive review like they're the very safe review where Adam just does not care. If you don't like Adam, he doesn't care. And with Incredibles 2, I watched Grace and Chris's review this morning, and they were both like, oh, yeah, very great, blah, blah, blah. Like, animation's wonderful, one of the best movies that um, I've seen this year, blah, blah. And then you go to uh, Adam's, and the way he talks about the movie is, I mean, he starts off with, I would, just, I would watch it. His review on Incredibles 2 I thought was pretty accurate. Um but he's always honest. And I think sometimes honesty is another thing that's lost nowadays in um, the modern age. Because we're, we're too afraid of the, the lashback. But yeah, Sin Missins does it in a very, very fun way, where I think Adam sometimes pushes it a little too far. It can become mean. Uh, Jocelyn says, have you gotten a chance to watch Troll Hunters? Del Toro really eases the audience into a darker vibe into the latest season. I have not. I should give that a chance, though. Uh, Jelly says, I think they are doing Ghibli movies in theaters again this year. They are, and I would definitely go see Spirited Away again. Jocelyn says, fun fact, Jurassic Park was supposed to be an animated 
was supposed to be animated using stop motion puppets. Halfway in, they switched to 3D. Jurassic Park and The Mummy are the few movies that use 3D that still hold up very well, in my opinion. Oh, I did not know that. I actually assumed... Because isn't the giant T-Rex actually a real puppet? I, I thought I read something on how that was such a monstrosity to work with. Maybe not, though. Um, Astorcia says, Have you seen YMS's breakdown of Synecdoche, New York? He has a video series of going through how much the movie actually has going on in it. There's so much to go over in it that he has actually hasn't even finished it yet, but has got five parts out that he started in 2014. You bet. Uh, another reason why Adam's my favorite movie reviewer is because I feel like I have very similar taste to him. His favorite movie is Holy Mountain, but a very close second is in Nekti, New York, and he has a review on it, and it is so in-depth. And now when I watch that movie, I pick up on so much extra details that I think would have passed me if I had not watched his review. So people like him, I appreciate so much because he really tries to see the details in movies, and I feel that I do the same with art as I try to look at the details in art. And I feel like he does the same thing just with film. And it allows me then to see film in a deeper, richer way. So I love Adam's videos, and I definitely would recommend him. So it's awesome that you know him, because I've been watching, I watched I, literally every review he's ever done, I've watched. And like I said, sometimes he can be a little mean, especially to M. Night Shyamalan, but it's funny <laughs> to some regard. Uh, Sudi says, that's why I've been starting to read audiobooks more. I can actually work and listen to it when I'm tired to listen to music. Yeah, I, you know what? It's something I should do more, honestly. I did that with, um, oh, what was it called? Oh, no. It was the one on the way that you think and how you are not your thoughts. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember what it's called. Victor would kill me. Oh, that bothers me. Um... But yeah, I, I listened to that while I worked, and I, I found myself every now and then I would kind of zone out, but I would just rewind like five, ten minutes and get back into it. But I, I did enjoy it quite a lot. I don't know why I don't do that more. I think maybe because it's just easier to listen to music or movies because it's meant for entertainment, where I think sometimes books that have this like deeper philosophy um, undertones that I, I kind of have to pay a little bit more attention to. Uh, Jim says, what do you think of Akira? Uh, I love Akira. I don't, I don't think it's because of nostalgia alone. I haven't seen it in like 10 years, but if I rewatched it, I bet I would have a similar opinion of it. I, I remember I watched it as a kid. Mind you, I just saw Spirited Away when I was 13, and that was my introduction to anything outside of Disney, and I was like, what is this? This is beautiful and the east knows how to make movies so much better than the west even though i still love disney, mov disney movies at the time um but uh, i watched after i watched spirit away i watched princess mononoke which i thought was really good and i wanted to see another one so i rented grave of the fireflies which was heart curdling i remember being like what is this <laughs> i was 13 when i watched that and that was definitely it deeper message than I was what I was prepared for and then after that I was like okay let me try one that looks a little more fun so I rented Akira and mind you I'm 13 and thinking what the hell am I watching uh I was a very intrigued little boy though I think anything that was different fascinated me especially in the film world so after Akira I was like oh my god like there is so much that I am not even aware of because I've been so uh bubbled into just Disney movies and what my parents would allow me to go see with them when we went to the theaters. So I kind of went on my own and started renting. I think after that I watched Paprika and that was another like super bizarre, weird one. And then it just, it just snowballed from there. And then I started getting into not as, not a lot of anime, but definitely ones that were kind of weird. And then it just got weirder and weirder. And then my film taste just got weirder and weirder. And now I would say I really like old film. I've been watching a lot of old film recently. I think because they didn't have special effects or these gimmicks that I think a lot of film nowadays uses to convince us that it's a good movie, where back then all they had was writing and acting. And yeah, there's some movies that really do have good shots. And definitely with, um, oh, I can't, what is it, Tikalski, the Russian director, 
Um, we're, they're very specific on like shot compositions, but a lot of the old movies that I've been watching are very much just focused on the writing and the way that it's delivered through the actor's performance. And it's they're so good. And I feel like we miss that nowadays because we're so focused on special effects and things that aren't storytelling. So I don't know, something to maybe keep in mind that you should check out some old movies. And if you want a recommendation, I guess that would be like a good ease into it. I would say All About Eve was really good, especially as like an artist and like trying to make it in the art world. I think that one is a good introduction to like an older movie that's more focused on dialogue. Um, obviously the, the classics Citizen Kane or Casablanca, uh, yeah, those are very good and you definitely should watch them, but I would recommend All About Eve as like an intro to older movies. Uh, Tigel says the T-Rex wasn't animatronic for a few scenes, mainly the ones where he smashes the car with the kids in it, but all the running and walking dinos are CG. The geared Triceratops was also an animatronic puppet. Okay, that's <laughs> that's what I thought too, but I wasn't sure. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, Astrosia said I loved his videos on M Night. Yeah, they're pretty funny. Uh, do do do. Tigel says the movie had a very nice balance between puppets and CG. Agreed. I mean, I'd have to watch it again, but I don't remember seeing a difference, a, a very like distinct difference between the 3D and the puppet ones. Um. Oh yeah, Jocelyn's just echoing what they what Tigel just said. Man, you really know Jurassic Park, Tigel. <laughs> I I did not know you were that big of a fan of Jurassic Park. How much? I only have 10 minutes. Guys, I ramble too much about movies. It's a habit I'll never break. I was only able to get a lobster and half a crab in. You know what? No, we're gonna. I'm gonna try to get this crab done before four o'clock. Uh, I was joking with my roommates, and um, some of my close friends think I should do this, but maybe every now and then on my YouTube channel, I'll do like a movie review, or maybe like a best of the year that I I would want to recommend to people to go check out. Because, yeah, I love art, and it's definitely my number one priority. But maybe every now and then, I could just slip in a movie review. And um, I don't know if that's something that interests you guys at all, but I, I love film so much, I think it would be very easy for me to record a simple like three-minute review of a movie. Why, thank you, Maisley Fox, for following. So when I'm drawing, I'm looking at where I think the dark kind of contrast points will be, and I just emphasize them. And I do that pretty much for all the animals that I've done on this drawing. You can see how all of a sudden like the form is starting to come out. And if ever there's two subject matters meeting like this, like the fin of this fish and the the arm of this crab, I usually have the one on the top be darker and then the one underneath be lighter. It's kind of a reverse realism. And I think it's because I like playing with the rules of realism. where like It, it kind of has this realism look to it, but you can tell something's off. And I think I just kind of like playing with with realism nowadays, where before I would try to follow it as closely as possible. But now that I'm older, I'm kind of like, you know what, I'm just going to have fun with it, because I've learned that it gets a better response and it looks more uh, original when you don't just follow realism 100%. And if you've been in my stream before, as you know that the artists that really intrigue me are not realism artists. They're the ones that are weird and uh, different. And I always get that question at cons is, who inspires you or what do you get inspired from? And I always tell them, like, obviously film and fashion and video games, uh, just, I guess, entertainment in a big bubble. But more than anything, other artists inspire me, but I split it into two distinct categories. 
quality and originality. So when I'm looking for quality, I look to the masters. I look to the people that have been doing this for years or the ones that have died long ago, like the Da Vinci's, the Michelangelo's, Raphael, etc. Or even like Rockwell or any of the ones that are past that created what I consider masterpieces. I look to them as a technical inspiration because they knew what they were doing and they were doing it well. And then for originality, I look to like the 16 to 19 year olds. Because even though they might not have the most technical prowess to them, they are experimenting. They are not afraid to try something new. And oftentimes, it may be not the most technically sound, in a lot of ways kind of sloppy, but the ideas are so solid that they'll be fine once they start honing in on their craft and really pushing themselves on a technical level. So when I look for inspiration, I look to the masters for technicality, and I look to the young artists for originality because unfortunately with the old masters I feel like oftentimes they're repurposing what they already know works or what has been trending where the new artists are going to be creating what will trend and I think that's something to be um, at least for me I'm definitely very aware of the distinction between the two Uh, Tichel says, I was always very obsessed with movies and their visual effects. I guess that would explain why you, you knew so much about Harry Potter films. I would constantly watch behind the scenes of how movies were made. That's why I studied more VFX in college. It makes total sense. Actually, so do I. Especially of movies that I may have thought were just okay. I feel like I get a deeper appreciation for them when I see the behind the scenes. And then for movies that I really love, I feel like I pick up on more that I didn't pick up on my first watch or on my, my viewing of the film. So I definitely think every artist should check out the behind the scenes, especially of art movies. Watch a Leica movie and then watch the behind the scenes. I, I think Paranorman is my favorite. Actually, it is my favorite Leica movie. And I thought they did so much well. But then for movies like Box Trolls, which I thought were a little, in, in terms of storytelling, a little not as well done in my opinion, but the behind the scenes, man, do you appreciate the amount of work and artistry that goes into making those movies? And especially with Box Trolls, they really pushed this very different look, which I loved. That's why I kind of wish the movie hit me harder on the storytelling part, because I thought that was a little weak. But in terms of the artistry, I thought it was so good that I, I actually watch, like watching the behind the scenes of Box Trolls more than I like watching the movie. Um, Fem says, maybe you should could also do a movie recommendation of the week every time at the start of the stream. Yeah, you know what? I will do that because I watch a new movie almost every day. So I could be like, oh, yeah, this past week, uh, there was this movie that I think you guys would like and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to do my best never to dog on movies. I think that's something that I used to do. And I realized that it's not it's not helping anyone just to be very negative about a movie that someone may enjoy, I think is the wrong way to go about reviewing movies. I think if there's a movie that you don't particularly, or you're not fond of, I think maybe pointing out some of the flaws that you feel are evident and are worth mentioning, but nothing more than that. Don't ever discredit someone for liking a movie that you don't like. And I'm, I'm kind of saying this out loud, but I'm saying this kind of to myself. Because that's a conversation I had to have with myself about stop being so mean because I realized I was making someone hate a movie that they loved just because I was pointing out things to them that they didn't notice. And it's not my place to uh, make someone feel less than because they enjoy a movie. If anything, I want to build up the movies that we can love together. Do, do, do. Uh, Spectre 4 says, did you see the latest movie about Vincent? I did. Loving Vincent? Um, man, actually, yeah, there's an art movie that you guys need to watch that is out and new. Loving Vincent. I mean, what a marvel at some of the way, uh, even the scene transitions, it's all painted. But I feel like they did kind of cheat in some of the shots of the film where you can kind of tell it was just painted over film. And it almost looks too close to realism or like they didn't put enough impressionism into the scene but you know what i feel like i am nitpicking because the amount of work that went into that movie i can't even imagine 
So I would definitely go check that one out as a recommendation, at least on a visual level alone. Do, do, do. <laughs> Jonah says I go to the movie to throw popcorn. <laughs> actually, yeah, we were we were watching Incredibles 2 last night and Kat, my actually my assistant, but primarily my best friend all throughout my life, she thinks it's really funny to throw popcorn at me at a movie and I had to sit next to her. So you can imagine. <laughs> uh, Tishel says, have you seen Samsara yet? You know what sucks? I just returned it to the library, but I didn't watch it because I know I have to pay full attention and I've been so busy recently that I feel like I wouldn't be doing myself a service if I half paid attention to it. So I keep renting it from the library, hoping that one of these weeks I'll have like a day where I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to spend a night and I'm just going to watch Samsara because I hear so many good things about it and I know I'll love it based on what people have told me about it. So I have not seen it yet and I am sorry. I know that I can't discuss it with you yet. Um, Spectre 4 says, there's also a movie about Will Turner, which is cool as well. That one I don't know, so you might have to tell me which one that is. Um, Wix says, hey Tim, this is maybe out of topic, but question, do you have any tips on starting a creative Twitch streaming? What's your experience as starting a Twitch stream? Um, You know, Twitch has been interesting for me because I started on Google Hangouts when I was at CG Cookie, and then that transitioned into Livestream.com, I believe. And then I was doing it through YouTube again, through Google Hangouts, and then I made the switch to Twitch before I left CG Cookie. So then my Twitch channel now, I mean, it, this is is pretty new to me still, and I just moved to the basement to have better lighting and everything. Uh I guess my biggest piece of advice with Twitch streams is be consistent. So if you have like a time slot that you know you'll probably be okay with hitting every week, uh, commit to that and then prove it. So for me, Wednesdays have always been a good day because I do cons on the weekend and sometimes uh, that can carry over into Monday. Sometimes we leave on Thursday. So Wednesday for me is a good time slot because I know for the most part I'll always be here. Like last week was an exception because we had to leave for Denver, but uh, that's kind of an anomaly, if I was honest with you. And I'm hoping to really bring the production back into my Twitch streams, which I feel like was lost in the last six months because I was so scattered. And unfortunately, I feel like my roommates had to deal with my stuff just being everywhere upstairs. But I finally moved downstairs. And I'm hoping to get some good lights for next week and um, just put a little more effort into this. So... I would my two pieces of advice would be be consistent and then push for quality and don't do it for the streamer. So d don't do it with the intention of I want to get popular on Twitch. Do it as like a I want to either discuss with people the art process or maybe just draw with other people who might also be drawing and kind of like either following along or just they're drawing with you. And that was my original intent when I do did it with CG Cookie was I wanted to draw with people. I didn't have coworkers that were in the art field. They were all 3D modelers. and Or I shouldn't say the art field, the concept drawing field. And they were all 3D modelers. So for me, I was just kind of lonely, if I was honest with you. So I think I started the Twitch streams as a way for me to connect with other artists um, while still being at work. And then it kind of grew into this thing that I wasn't aware it was going to grow into. And now it's just more of a fun, casual thing for me. But I'm kind of getting back into the realm of treating it a little more seriously and having fun with it like I used to. So we'll see where it goes, but I don't want to make any promises I can't keep. So for now, I'm going to keep it more fun, more loose, and we'll just see where it goes. I guess that would be my third piece of advice. Have fun with it. Don't, don't be too serious. Because if you put on a persona that's not authentic to who you actually are, I feel like it will come across as being disingenuous. And I think what you say and what you do just won't feel true. And to me, I feel like that's a loss. If you as an artist can't come across as an honest person, at least to what you're trying to say in your work or even like in discussion, then I feel like you're putting on this weird facade of who you want people to think you are rather than being true to who you are and then having people genuinely liking the person you are. So just be yourself. 
Uh, Tishel says, Kat, you're your assistant now? Jesus, we need to catch up. I missed a few things, apparently. Like, literally, as of last Tuesday. Like, I just hired her, and it, she's been phenomenal. I, I can't believe how much more organized I am just in one week of having her. Even things with, like, emails, and I'm really bad with communication, so having her kind of be more accountable for um, that stuff has helped me a lot. And I, I think it's probably weird for you guys to think, well, how many, or how can you not communicate with people through email or Instagram or all that stuff? I think it's just because I grew up so introverted that I, sometimes I feel like I play the role of an extrovert, but answering questions and doing that nonstop actually drains me pretty fast. And I, I guess I've gotten to the point where I can't keep up with it on my own. Um, and it's unfortunate because then I feel like I have to have other people respond for me. But uh, I just, I think for my own sanity, I need help with that kind of stuff now. There we go. Well, at least I got the lobster, <laughs> lobster. At least I got the lobster and most of the crab done before the stream. But I know we're already over. So I'm going to answer just some last minute questions and I'm going to go ahead and go to Subway. So let's see here. Uh, Spectre 4 says, I will put the movie on Discord then after Vincent's movie really liked it. Yes, actually, I will. I will definitely check the Discord more for, I guess, if you guys are interested in movie stuff. I can post stuff on there more that intrigues you at all. We have a Discord channel and it's something that I want to get back into, especially after the next two months of this craziness happens. Uh, I want to be more active on there again. Uh, thank you, guys. Oh, Sudi, that's great advice. Don't be discouraged if you don't get many viewers in the beginning. Uh, it also helps to be an active part of the Twitch creative community. It's, I'm glad you brought that up, Sudi. I, for the first year, got like six to ten viewers every stream, and that would be it. And it never disappointed me. I never was like, oh, I wish I had more. Oh, I'm not really doing anything right. To me, I was like, hell yeah, six viewers? Like, awesome. Like, you want to draw alongside me? And I was 20 through 22 at the time. And I remember being like, man, anyone that just comes to stream for two hours, that like, that's nuts. Like, you're going to spend your time during the day just watching me draw and talk. So I couldn't agree more, Tsudi. Don't get discouraged if you don't get viewers because that's not that should not be the goal. Your goal isn't to be popular. Your goal should be something else. So before you start a Twitch, figure out what your goal is. Like, what are you trying to achieve on Twitch? And then go on Twitch. And try not to have it be something artificial like, I want to get popular. Um, doo -doo -doo. Ari says, have you ever watched Hamlet? I have not. So that's something I guess I will have to watch. Uh, Tishel says, if you want Samsara, I have a copy on file. I'll send it to you. Yes. Like, like I said, though, I need a good night where I can watch it and pay full attention. I don't want to skimp on Samsara. But that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, Wufomi says, have you seen the human videos? It's a series of videos of different peoples from all sorts of culture, cultures laughing and making expressions. No, I have not, but that sounds very intriguing. I'm going to write that one down humans wait where's my, my little notepad yeah that sounds wonderful uh well, Fumi says i think it may be an invaluable resource to have when you want to see fresh faces and get into their cultures languages stories and how it reflects on each individual that's great yeah no thank you for that i'm gonna definitely watch that and if you guys don't know who Sudi Bear is, I would go follow her on Twitch too. She's one of our new friends. Well, new-ish. We met at Salt Lake, but really we started talking at OhioCon. And then we were we saw her this last weekend at Denver Comic Con. Oh my god, I didn't even show you all the stuff I got. Wait. Oh, hold on. Wait, let me... I'm going to get... I bought some originals. Hold on. Let me go get those really quick. Oh, this is so embarrassing. I'm sorry. Um, I got so much stuff from Denver, and I'm not even showing it off. 
I think because I was so packed away and I'm so focused on drawing that slipped my mind. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. So this is, and you know what, I'm going to give shout outs so that if you guys want to follow them as well. I believe it's this one is at slop. I'm going to double check to make sure I'm spelling this right, but it's slop jockery. And he was sitting across from me at this convention. And what was funny is I've been following him for like two years. And as soon as I saw his banner, I was like, no way. Like, I, I know who that is. And the whole weekend I sat across from him. So this is his work. And this is actually an original. And it was intriguing because look how small this is. Like This is my hand and that's um, how small it is. But this is, in my opinion, this is so gorgeous. And it's very easy for me to transcend um, like gore or horror in art because to me, I don't really care about does it offend I, I don't know. To me, I I don't see this like bloody, evil manifestation on a painting. Because me and him talked about that about how sometimes my get stuff gets compared to being satanic or I'm uh, dark or I I don't know. It's just so silly sometimes what people will interpret based on the imagery that they're shown. But I love his work so much, and his attention to detail. So wonderful. And then having these just solid blocks of color break up the rest of the piece, I thought was excellent. And this is Slop Jockery. His real name is Dusty. And I got to have a very fun weekend with him. I talked with him a lot. We went to the restaurants all the, all the nights. And uh, they have a restaurant called Tokyo Joe, which is like the Japanese subway. And I kept joking that he like was part owner. And I started convincing people that he owned Tokyo Joe's. <laughs> So it's pretty funny. But Dusty's a great guy. Please go give him a follow. He does a new drawing, or a new painting, I should say, like every day. And he is so good, in my opinion. I just, I love his work. And then he gave me uh, a, a big piece of this. Which I don't know if, I think that's in my big case, so I don't have that with me right now. Okay, the next thing I got was, this is, I forgot her name. Oh shoot, I don't have it on me right now. Man, I am I'm just not prepared, guys. But I will give a proper shout out next week then. I'll I'll pull out everything that I got. But I bought this original from her. And I thought this was really intriguing. And then also I got da -da -da -da, a commission of red, because it was only fifty bucks, and I was like, What? Like that's such a good price for your work and I love your work. So I got that done as well. I met this guy named Dean Stewart. He did some of these gorgeous color work, and it's like big and bold, and just inventive. Where was the page that I really liked? I like this series of these travelers, like this little duck head. So he's another artist that I really like. Shoot, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna have a better shout out next week because I, I don't feel prepared and I feel like I'm not giving a good rec uh, shout outs. Because I even got stuff from Sudi, I got stuff from Aria Fawn. Um, there, there's just a lot of artists that I want to give proper credit to. So that'll be the first thing I do next week on the stream. So uh, if you're looking forward to seeing some new art, I will definitely show it and I'll give some shout outs for you guys to follow if it intrigues you. Okay. Uh, oh yes, and thank you, um, Aria, for posting the right Instagram. Okay, uh, wait, what are you saying right there? I need more light though. I know, I need a... Uh, blink twice if I'm in trouble because I it just looks like I've been kidnapped and I'm hiding somewhere. But I promise this will be different. Sean really wants to get like a green screen or do something weird back here. <laughs> I don't know what he has planned, but I'm sure it'll be something better than this awkward basement light that I have. But at least you can see the drawing though. Like that's much better than the past like few weeks. I feel like you couldn't even see what I'm doing. So I guess I'll give you guys one more shot of this because I will most likely finish it before next week. So you guys get kind of the first glimpse of what it looks like. And you know what? I'll show you the chickens because I haven't really showed anyone the chickens down here. And there's, there's the turkey kind of trying to blend in with the other chickens. 
See, he's like, no, I'm a part of you guys. Yeah, I'm one of you. There's my pig. You know, chicks? And I, I threw in some chicks alongside the roosters and hens. These were really fun to draw. I didn't realize how much fun I had drawing the chickens. But honestly, the fish have been the most fun thing to draw on this whole piece. And for those of you who like animals, you'll very clearly be able to tell which ones I made up and which ones are real. <laughs> so I'm hoping this will be done before next Wednesday. But if not, that might be what I'm working on. But hopefully I'm working on something new for you guys. And yeah, thanks so much for coming to this live stream. So like I said, I do these every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time. They're supposed to be two hours, but like today I go over and I usually talk about something related to art and or movies or the life of an artist or what it means to be a traveling convention artist or how to make money as an artist or even just general tips on how to draw and step-by-step -step techniques. So thank you guys so much for coming for today and hopefully I'll see you next week.